Senator Jack Miller served as chairman for the hearings that were recently held in Des Moines. These were for the United States Special Committee on Aging. The emphasis was concerning the rural elderly. Why this particular subject? Probably because we haven't concentrated on this particular area of older Americans since the committee was established. The committee was established about seven years ago, and while it has engaged in numerous uh, undertakings uh, through its various subcommittees, engaged in a considerable amount of research, a lot of reports, helped uh, father and pass the Older Americans Act, and I think generally made progress in the area of older Americans, we're now beginning to understand and uh, to concentrate on special problems uh, as far as areas of living are concerned. And so it was decided that we'd hold a series of hearings on the problems of older Americans living in the rural areas, whether they're rural non-farm areas or rural farm areas. And uh, I think the testimony that we received during this hearing here in Des Moines, Iowa, indicated that there are some problems that are peculiar to older Americans living in those rural areas as against the older Americans living in urban areas. Now, could you identify some of these that are pe peculiar to the rural area? Yes, I think you might summarize it by saying it's a problem of access. Access to facilities, access to uh, doctors and dentists and even pharmaceutical uh, uh, stores. Uh, the need for transportation. The average older American living in an urban area does at least have an opportunity to get a taxi or a bus. There are many of our little communities where they have no taxi service and an older person who has uh, either no car or has not uh, uh, qualified for a driver's license has no place to go except maybe through a friend or a neighbor. And uh, this makes it extremely difficult, and in some cases, literally forces them to move away. Now, uh, uh, the need for, for, uh, for service uh, uh, or faci facilities, uh, there may be no hospital, no nursing home, or no particular type of a nursing home in a particular small community. Most larger areas uh, have all of them. So it's primarily a problem of access. And how are you going to organize? How are you going to arrange the distribution of facilities within, let's say, a rural area complex so that perhaps in this town there will be a hospital, in this town a nursing home, but the facilities will be there where they're more readily available than they are now? Was there a feeling that perhaps in planning and all different sorts of legislation, community planning, uh, that perhaps the impact of out-migration or the higher proportion of senior citizens could affect other governmental projects within a community? Well, uh, I think it was well brought out that uh, there are federal programs that are not necessarily pitched to the older people, which can have a very great impact on the older people. Uh, the area of property taxes, for example. Now, while this is primarily a state matter, this is an example. Uh, property tax impact can have a, not only affect the younger person, but the older person. In fact, it can have such an effect on the older person as to cause him to lose his home or move away uh, to an apartment and uh, terribly disrupt uh, his pattern of living. Uh, from a federal standpoint, we have uh, many programs, uh, education programs, uh, for example, uh, programs which are calculated to help support uh, education after uh, one normally leaves college or leaves high school, the adult education programs. Uh, there's a need for continuing education among the elderly. Uh, the thirst for knowledge does not stop at the age of 65. And uh, I think that we can uh, in our federal programs as well as at the state level. We can pay a little more attention to the impact that this program will have on this one area of society, the older Americans. And I think if we do that, we can probably come up with a better program than we're coming up with now. Do you think there is much difference within a city as there is within a rural area as far as the particular needs uh, within different segments of the, of the uh, city? Well, on the basis of the testimony that we received today, 
there isn't any question but what there's a substantial difference among rural areas. There are some rural areas where there has been a very high uh, out migration of younger people, and as a result, you have a very high population density of older people. There are other rural areas where this is not so. It was brought out, for example, uh, I think Dr. Morris from the Institute of Gerontology at Iowa City gave us a chart which shows that uh, generally among the two southern tiers of counties in Iowa, you have a very high number of people over 65, whereas you get into other areas of Iowa and the number is relatively small. Uh, that being the case, you're going to have a difference in problems, you have a different intensity, difference in needs for nursing homes and medical care. And uh, of course, if you have a, a rural area that is fairly populous as against a rural area that is not, you may have to combine four or five or six counties to, per, to uh, get the job done of providing facilities. We have what is called the TENCO project, consisting of 10 counties down in southern Iowa. This was uh, given considerable praise for the way it is organized to meet not only the problems of the older people, but the problems of the economy in that area, uh, generally speaking. So I don't think that we should get into uh, 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 our frame of thinking that we're going to come up with a solution that fits in this county or in this series of two or three counties that's going to be the pattern that should be put to fit some other situation elsewhere within our own state and even more so at the national level. We were warned that uh, something tailor-made in Washington is not necessarily going to fit in this particular state or in this particular area of a state. We have to do a better job of planning and this brings in local community people, uh, perhaps with some guidance from the outside, but it's going to definitely involve more people at the local level. And I suppose I could summarize what we learned today by having it emphasized again, no matter how much money is spent in Washington, no matter how much is spent at the state level, granted that we need it, uh, this isn't going to get the job done unless the people at the local level, through service clubs, church organizations, and other community activities, uh, join in getting the objective of a better life for our older Americans. I am aware of, and I know you're aware of, the importance of the Institute of Gerontology, but I suspect a number of Iowans do not realize that such an institution exists. Could you comment as to whether you have been able to make use of their information prior to this hearing? Yes, I have. Uh, every member of the Iowa legislature, of course, is familiar with the Institute on Gerontology, which is a, uh, consists of some offices uh, staffed by very able people and dedicated people, uh, headed by uh, Dr. Morris, who's also uh, an assistant uh, uh, dean of the Iowa Medical School. And its whole focus of attention is research on the problems of the aging. We have, I think, the best institute on gerontology of all of the 50 states. And the institute has been called upon by many federal agencies for information and counsel because of the work that it's done. I don't know how long it's been going. I would guess it's been going in Iowa City for at least 20, 25 years. Uh, They've, uh, they've uh, worked on problems down at our Institute of Gerontology before some people in other states ever even heard, heard of them. So we're well ahead, and we should be, of course, because outside of Florida, there are more people over 65 here in Iowa than any other state of the Union per capita. And so we have a problem, and, no, uh, and it's to be expected that we should have the best institute on gerontology in the nation, but it's somewhat satisfying to be able to say that we do, too. Very, very briefly, which of the areas do you think you would put priority on as far as first solution? The, the economic, the health, and tr or transportation, or are they all too interwoven? They're pretty well interwoven as far as the rural areas are concerned, with this one exception. Uh, the immediate past director of the Commission on Aging for Iowa, Mr. Ray Schwartz, I thought made a very good point when he said that no matter how much money you get, no matter how much money is funded out of Washington or out of uh, Des Moines, Iowa, uh, this isn't going to uh, satisfy the problems in the rural areas of access. We're going to have to have access, and that is the number one problem for rural America. Thank you very much, Senator Miller. Senator Jack Miller chaired the 
hearings held by the United States Special Committee on Aging of the United States Senate. And thank you. Thank you. Dr. W. W. Morris is a director of the Institute of Gerontology at Iowa City. He's associate dean of the College of Medicine at the University of Iowa and vice chairman of the Commission of Aging. And I think that it is in this capacity that uh, we would like to ask him, following the United States Senate Special Committee on Aging hearings in Des Moines, uh, some of his impressions as to the priority needs of the rural aging citizen. I'm glad you started off with this question of priority needs because if I could go back a moment to one of the uh, sets of testimony from one of the witnesses, an older man himself, Mr. Hoyt Bonham from Montezuma. Mr. Bonham kept trying to get across the idea that the older people in the state, particularly the members of his group called Associated Groups of Elderly in Iowa, wanted to know something about what their priority was in the thinking of the United States Senate and particularly in the government as a whole as far as programming is concerned and he couldn't get a very good answer. I'm not sure why, but there are three major areas that keep coming up again and again and again whenever you study, talk about, research into, or whatever you do with aging people, be they rural or urban. And these three are health, income, and what I call the twin problems of loneliness and dependency. Now, if you stop and think of this on the face of it, these are sensible problems because they're things all of us are concerned about. We want to be sure we know where our next dollar is coming from so we can buy food and pay the rent. We want to know that if we have poor health, we can get health care, and if we have good health, how we can keep it that way for as long as possible, because this is related to how long we're going to live and how happy we'll be while we're doing it. And man is a social being who must live with other people in order to be happy and find life satisfying, and so the problem of loneliness comes in. Dependency is a problem because uh, of a peculiar paradox. All our lives, we prepare for being independent. And having done a real good job of preparing to be independent at a certain stage of life, often 65 or something younger, we find ourselves being pushed into a, a position of dependency again. And this isn't dignified and it isn't very comfortable for most people. I think if anything, uh, interesting came out of these hearings. It was the fact, on the one hand, that the problems of older people in rural areas are basically the same kind of problems that people experience in urban areas. There is a difference, however, and the difference has to do with such things as demography and the dispersion of people and the ready access to services and information and such uh, elementary things as transportation. Now, a number of things in your report were identified, but two I'd like to uh, talk about at the present time. One is the planning in the very rural areas that have the out-migration and the high proportion of the older individuals compared to the low of the younger individuals. And the, in the health area, Many times the facilities on the one hand, however, not the personnel or the right type of facilities for the needs, and I'm thinking in terms of the uh, long-term uh, care beds. Would you like to comment in this area? Well, this is a tough problem. I'm glad to say that the College of Medicine and the whole uh, area division now of health services at the university and I know this is true also of, uh, of the staff and faculty at Iowa State University also are working on this problem because they recognize that it is an important problem. Basically, the problem is almost identical with the problems of out-migration. If you have, in the southern two tiers of county, not all of them, but many of them, you have a picture of younger people, middle-aged people leaving to go either to more 
fruitful areas of employment and living, such as cities. Or, on the other hand, as some people put it, things are getting so bad in the rural areas that younger people and middle-aged people who can do it are leaving. Whatever the cause, it's happening. Now, by the same token, it's difficult to uh, imagine or to talk a uh, young physician or a young nurse or a young dentist or any other young professional into going into one of these areas because they know about as well as anybody else that these are areas of decline and not of, uh, of upward mobility. Well, because of all of these things, uh, it looks pretty almost hopeless for uh, some of the rural areas. I don't think it really is. And, and if we wanted to pick out priorities for Iowa state government, and for the Commission on Aging, I'd like to see us really put our minds and energies to work on how can you reverse this trend if it's possible, and I think it is possible, and what are the kinds of things that need to be done so that younger and middle-aged people will want to stay, or other people move in, or young professionals from all uh, of the different fields uh, go there to settle down and, and make their uh, life of practice in those communities. I think what it's going to take is a whole restructuring of, uh, of county governments and community governments, but at the same time, I think it's going to take efforts uh, on the part, creative efforts on the parts of the College of Medicine, for example, and the College of Dentistry and the College of Nursing and other professional schools to go into some of these areas with demonstration projects to show not only how it can be done and what can be done, but the great satisfactions that are likely to come from trying to do it even. If, they, if we were to do this and then rotate some of our professional students while they're still in training through these demonstration units so they get first-hand experience in this kind of an activity, this kind of a life, I believe a whole almost automatic restructuring of community uh, organization would start to take place. People would begin to, uh, because of the emphasis that would be put on it, to build better schools and to uh, perhaps build a library, which they don't have at the moment, to, to uh, do a host of things that add to the cultural values of the community. And having done this, you then have done the things that say to young people, well, let's stay around because it looks better and to young doctors and, and others, uh, let's move there because things are looking up. This is what I think has to be done, but that's a hard job to sell in the first place. It's an even harder job to do, but if we ever want to do it, uh, we have to stop talking about it and, and, and start doing it. Now, oftentimes mentioned was loneliness. How does this fit into to the thing that you identified, which I did not see identified in the other reports, and that was the need for the mental health care. Well, I'm not sure that loneliness and the need for mental health care are, are necessarily that closely related. I think the, the whole uh, emphasis that I tried to make in my oral presentation, and I don't think I made it in the long written report, this emphasis was that which has to do with doing those kinds of things which will help us keep the older person in mind as an individual human being and not lose them. Now, what's happening now is that we run the risk of losing older people because we're just neglecting their interests and their concerns and really not paying attention to them. Not because we're mean ordinary people, but because uh, society has so many groups demanding attention, as they say, of which the aged are only one, that it's quite easy to, to lose them. Plus the fact uh, that they tend not to complain about their lots, and, uh, and if you don't complain, it's easier to, to uh, neglect that kind of a person, even though he should be praised and, and, and somebody should pay attention to him. But it's like saying that you're in favor of virtue and against sin, I guess. Our <laughs> <laughs> guest has been William, uh, Wood, Dr. Woodrow Morris, 
Director of the Institute of Gerontology and Associate Dean of the College of Medicine at the University of Iowa. He is Vice Chairman of the Iowa Commission on Aging and was contributing to the United States Special Committee on Aging hearings recently held in Des Moines. 